Uh, my pleasure to introduce Craig. Craig's primarily an HON3 modeler for 35 plus years, and also an HO modeler of Canadian prototype. His layout, though, is an HON3 version of the Rio Grande Southern First District. Craig gives back to the hobby by writing a regular column for the Narrow Gauge and Shortline Gazette, and he's presented several previous times on Off the Beaten Track. And the other thing I'll add here is Craig also holds Master Model Railroader Certificate number 553, which uh, working my way through that myself is, uh, it requires you to learn and do an awful lot of things in order to earn that. So I, I think uh, Craig's got a great clinic tonight and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Craig. Okay, so I, I'm Craig Symington. So let's, we'll get on with this uh, and, IT expert by day, can't use Zoom at night. So um, I'll start my presentation here. So uh, Dave Adams asked me to do this presentation um, oh, uh, about six weeks back. And so this is kind of a bit of a disclaimer. Um, he asked me to do a presentation on working on brass locomotives. Um, I've done that in uh, HON3, HOSN3, um, nothing bigger than that for decades. I've probably worked on hundreds of locomotives. And um, so a disclaimer here, I, I don't claim to be an expert or a professional at this. I only claim to be experienced. Um, and uh, another disclaimer, I've, over the years, I fixed a lot of locomotives that experts and professionals supposedly worked on. So I'm going to present some um, tips and things that I've discovered along the way that's made this easier for me. And hopefully you can become your own, uh, I guess, brass builder or basher and learn from this. So um, I've, uh, there's, there's uh, Jim Vale did a really good series back in the March 89 to March 1990 series on getting a brass local uh, ready for paint. Um, I've often thought about doing uh, an article in the Gazette on getting uh, locomotives um, running properly and 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 that kind of stuff but Jim did such a good job in that series I there really isn't a whole lot to add to it so if you're really looking for good information on getting rid of shorts and binds and all sorts of the usual stuff um if you can get a copy of the cd or an old issue of uh, the gazette there's really this the information he presented there you know stands and stands and now as as it did before the only thing that's different is there's just different suppliers for motors and a few other minor options. So I've never actually written an article on that. If you follow along in the Gazette, I've um, written quite a few, um, I call them brass bashing articles. And um, so usually it's HON3, I've done one on SN3. And what I'm trying to do in those articles is um, just take a project from start to finish and share some tips along the way and hopefully encourage other people to just kind of give it a try. So if you're looking for information um, outside this clinic, um, there's some pretty good sources there, Jim's especially. So what I'm going to do uh, tonight is um, I'm going to talk about things that aren't really covered there. Uh, just some tips of things that have helped me along the way to make it a lot easier. So and that's where we're at. So working on brass, as probably lots of you know, can be unbelievably frustrating. Um, and I admittedly, I've given up on some models after spending way too much time trying to get them to work and spent way too much money on bits and pieces and gearboxes and motors, and they still never ran. But for the most part, uh, most of them I've managed to get running, and I find it extremely rewarding to uh, to succeed and kind of beat the beat the puzzle. Um, and I, I find the challenge is good for the soul. So one thing that um, really doesn't get discussed about working on brass is, is you know, selecting a model before you even start. So, and, and I, this is information I pass upon people that are looking to get into buying brass locomotives and uh, just to pick a model. And generally when I work on a project, I, I'm pretty selective of now about which models I pick. Um, because I've kind of learned along the ways that you can invest a lot of time and money into a model and it's not so great. So generally what I, the advice I give people is, is um, check, check the wheel wear. So if it's a model you already have, you purchased another time or you're looking to buy one to, for this project, 
this is kind of my rule of thumb when I'm when I'm starting a project or buying a model is I, I look at the wheel tread uh if and this in these three pictures is the exact same model it's three totally different models I own all three of them the one on the left is brand new it's never been run the wheels are super shiny on it the one in the middle there's a little bit of scratches on the wheels and the one on the far right is uh you can see the brass plating brass showing through and the platings wore off so what I find is if you're picking a model that's never been run it's mint it's been in a box for 20 or 30 years or however long you know sometimes that that's good it's unless it hasn't been wrecked or anything but that could also just mean that it's somebody else couldn't get it running it's full of shorts and vines and bad builds so generally if I find a model that's pretty mint and has a little bit of running on it I, I find that to be a good sign because if somebody else had it running then it'll probably keep running and the one on the far right I've bought some old junkers that have been run a lot so the good news is they definitely run well and they're not full of shorts and vines um, but the bad news is, is they're pretty wore out. And by the time they get to the level that this one is where the plating's gone, usually the, um, side rod holds holes for the screws and are oblong and worn and it's pretty sloppy. And I used to buy these old models just for a challenge and you could get them cheap. Um, but so I take these old, these old turds and make them into something really nice um and I'd be proud of the work and it was a good challenge but in the end it still kind of smelled like a turd so I've stopped doing that so just some advice to pick your starting point um so along the way I've discovered that having the right tools and supplies makes it a lot easier so I've been doing this for decades and I slowly built up a, an arsenal of supplies so I'm going to just kind of talk about this is one of my bins full of bits and pieces. So one of the things I do is I um, I stock a lot of screws. Uh, Northwest Shortline sells um, uh, like uh, packs of different sizes of you know they'll be if you want to order 1.4 millimeter they'll give you a bunch of different lengths in a in a blister pack for whatever it is like 15 bucks or something it gives you covers most of the bases. So I started that way and then over the years I've slowly picked up screws along the way and I, I generally buy most of mine from Northwest Shortline um, in the scales that I work in so it's always HON3, HO a lot and sometimes SN3. I find that the 1.4 millimeter and 2 millimeters are the ones I use by far the most and one of the nice things about having a good supply of screws around is when you're working on a model almost certainly one of the screws or bits and pieces is going to fly into the abyss and when you've got no spare that gets to be a pretty severely panic-stricken moment um when you have lots of spares I just don't care I look for it don't find it quickly just replace it so that's really nice and a lot of the older models come with um slot head screws and those are a real pain in the butt to use um so sometimes if it's a model I really like or I'm getting frustrated with the slot screws I'll just replace them all with Phillips head screws and the nice thing about the Phillips head screws is if you take a little dab of grease on your end of your screwdriver, uh, it'll stick the screw to it. So if you're, um, it, it, that tends, I use that a lot because that tends to be helpful instead of dropping the screws inside the boiler and things like that. And then especially like gearbox covers are usually a one millimeter screw and they're super small and they're a royal pain in the butt to put on. If you just put a little dab of grease on the end of a screwdriver, it'll stick to the screwdriver and the kind of solves a lot of frustration uh, other place you can find screws uh ebay amazon they're usually marketed for eyeglasses i've bought some of those but i just always come back to the northwest shortline ones and for me i stocked every size that northwest shortline has and i buy the 50 packs of the ones i use lots of so the other thing is washers i go through washers like crazy so um i gotta get my pointer going here um i'll show you on should have got this going already so when I'm working on brass so like this model here on the right always it seems that these the main rods here will rub on the side rods you know if you get lucky and get a good model off this off what's that right, 117 right, yeah no this is a really good price um so if usually they they'll have some washers especially here where the main side rod reaches the the driving wheel um, a lot of times if I've got them flipped over in the cradle like this or I'm running them, you'll hear a clicking sound. 
and uh, that's usually the rubbing. So what I do is I buy a lot of different washers. Northwest Short Lines has a, 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 a pack of different ones. Uh, I found Walther surprisingly has some pretty good ones too. And um, th that's what I use. And sometimes I also keep these fiber washers in these ones here, like the ones that Katie would sell. And sometimes what I find is these, if you get too much slop, some models, the uh, powered driver, the non-insulated one will slide in and maybe momentarily short against the frame. So sometimes if you take one of these fiber washers, you put it on the axle between the, the wheel and the frame, it'll keep it from touching and stopping short. So I, I, this is my bin of washers. So whenever I see a different washer size, I just buy them. Um, couplings. So um, if you're lucky, you don't have to remotor the model you have and, you, and what you have works good, but almost always uh, an older model will have a dried out uh, rubber coupling on it for the older style don't have a drive shaft. So I stock this, this, this is silicon tube. And you buy it on, I think I buy it on, on eBay, a uh, meter at a time. It's like two bucks or something like that. So I uh, stock a bunch of that and buy the thick wall stuff, not the thin wall. The thin wall will twist into a pretzel uh, with the torque of the motor. The thick wall stuff is what you want. And uh, inside diameter would be 1.5 millimeter or uh, two or 2.4. This is generally for those scales. And these are slip joint universal shafts. You can get these in different places. These ones are boo rim ones that I bought through Richard Bennett off the um, uh, Brass Builders Facebook group. And then of course, Northwest Shortline has the cups and, and uh, balls that you put with their shaft material. So that I generally stock that. Um, I understand that Hobbytown has be really good uh, cups and balls. I've never bothered using them yet, but uh, that's just another source. Of course, when you're uh, if you're rebuilding a drivetrain, remotoring, even changing um, the rubber tubing on an older model, a lot of times you're going to have to shim out the the shafts. This is super easy. Uh, Northwest Shortline sells all these adapters from one size to another. Uh, Nigel Lawton out of the UK sells them too. Um, and then these are uh, you can if you kind of astute at this these are fishing crimps that uh, i bought off ebay so these guys here are really expensive like northwest shorts like five bucks or something for two little little bits of metal where this thing the fishing crimps was like three dollars for 50 of them or something like that so but these aren't as precise but they can still work so i, I generally stock a bunch of these just make it easier um metal stock i have way more metal stock than this but this is generally what i always use um, I, I make uh, brass cradles for the motors um, if I'm not using a, a torque arm type setup for the for the motor to the gearbox. If it's just sitting uh, in, uh, if I'm putting the motor in a, at a bed of silicone and um, using a rubber tube drive, I'll use this 30 thou brass to make a little cradle and then that's what it'll, um, that's what the motor will sit in. The other thing I use is this, I think it's eight. 8 thou uh, phosphor bronze. I make wipers out of this stuff. So I just keep a sheet of that. And I got all sorts of other brass, but this is the primary stuff I use for working on, on brass engines if I'm doing uh, remoter jobs. So speaking of that, um, what I've done over the years, so I've, I've kind of changed my tactics over the years. At one time, I thought you had to change all the gearboxes to the newest and best and greatest and whatever, and put a torque arm setup. And a torque arm setup is where you physically connect the gearbox to the motor versus using a rubber tube and the rubber so the rubber tube keeps the gearbox and the motor together um, but uh, uh, if you want to do a torque arm if you want to use one of those slip joint universal shafts you have to do a torque arm or they, it'll slip apart so anyway so I used to think you had to do those big fancy things but over the years I've kind of changed my thoughts on that I've got um another model it's actually standard gauge and i changed the gearbox that came in it and this it was one of these this is a uh, an old sam Honksa gearbox and i changed it to both these blue rims these ones on the left are blue rim gearbox these are fantastic like amazing gearboxes i get those that richard bennett he gets them straight from uh uh sam Honksa, i believe um no not sam blue rim he gets them from blue rim sorry and then uh, then the Northwest Shortline ones. And uh, I found that 
by the time you put a sound decoder and stuff in, you can't tell the difference on, for the most part. So now my philosophy is if the existing gearbox is pretty good, doesn't make much noise and it runs smooth, I just keep it. I don't change them because as soon as you change them, uh, then you're dealing with recording the gear or the, the drivers and then you can put a wobble in the driver and all sorts of other pain. So I don't change them, but um, anyway, so on gearboxes, if you get on the Facebook group, uh, the brass whatever workshop, you can order these. These are about 60 US dollars a piece. They're unbelievably good. They're so smooth. Um, and then Northwest Shortline still has them. Uh, I had a um, little word of warning after they moved from Washington. I found that their gearboxes were not as good as they used to be. Hopefully they fixed them. I haven't ordered one in a while. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then, then these old ones that came with the malls are sometimes just good. Go with them. So uh, motors, all sorts of motors out there. Um, you know, we've got uh, Sam, uh, was it Sagami and Mabuchi and all them have all disappeared. But there's still a really good source on eBay, especially. And of course, Northwest Shortline stocks a lot of motors. So you can go straight to them. A lot of the motors that Northwest Shortline stocks, you can find them on eBay for less money. But Northwest Shortline's done the work and guaranteed you that it's the right motor. Um, so some of the ones I, 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 um, I've got a lot of different motors I stock. Some of them are not very good. I just bought them on eBay just to see if they're any good. But these are the ones that are really good. Um, just starting from left to right, this is a Canon motor. Uh, this is what is generally in uh, most new, larger, probably HO and probably SN3 brass locomotives. Uh, these are, we get those, I order those from Richard Bennett through, from Blue Rim directly. These are about $25 or something. And you can sometimes find them on eBay. I heard they potentially might not be available anymore, but they're a really good motor. These are the ones if you ever, People are talking about their eight millimeter, 18 millimeter square ones off of eBay. Uh, the um, Mabuchi, yeah, yeah, Mabuchi motors. Um, these are amazing. They're three dollars. They're unbelievable. They're so good, and they they're super powerful and really smooth. I've used these in HO standard gauge, and they work really good. There are a couple of things about these guys though. This cap comes off the end here. I left it in the on in this picture to get the uh, motor tabs. Some of these come with a capacitor on. I've been told that you need to take those capacitors off, otherwise it'll mess with your back EMF on your sound decoders. Um, but these are really good and they'll fit in HO standard gauge and SN3 and they're incredibly powerful and they're made for, supposedly made for the automotive industry for power mirrors. Um, I troll eBay a lot for surplus um, cordless motors. Um, I search for SCAP, uh, Fallhaub, or Maxon. Uh, here's an SCAP motor. I, I stumbled into these. Um, like these are, if you're buying them new, they'd be over a hundred bucks. I think I paid like 10 bucks for this one. And they are, this one here is I think 16 millimeters. I use this one, small HO stuff, and it would work in larger HO and three. And um, if you search on eBay, they you look around, you'll find lots of other options. There's a few there that are marketed for as tattoo motor and they're coreless. Uh, they're really good. Um, if you're looking on, uh, I'll go through here. I'll tell you about how to pick a motor. So this one here is a 15 millimeter square Mabuchi. I have not used one of these, but apparently the, the guys are using these in, um, in HON3 locomotives. And from my testing of a bunch of these that I have, they're exactly as good as these 18 millimeters. They're super powerful and nice and smooth. Um, on the right here is another favorite motor of mine. You can buy these from Northwest Shortline. I found the same ones on eBay. So whatever is 20 bucks for Northwest Shortline. I think this is the same one I found on eBay for probably $2. Um, and these are, I'm pretty sure, are almost the same or exactly the same motors that are using the Blackstone locomotives. Um, cause I had a bunch of just the motors from back in the Blackstone days. Uh, these I've used in small H one three and these are using the geese and those brass bashing articles I did. If you're looking for a motor to, for, um, a couple tips for finding a motor that's suitable. If you don't want to just go to Northwest short line or wherever, and you just want to find your own, uh, and save a bunch of money. Um, I got a, just a way that I do things totally unsophisticated. 
Um, my criteria for finding a motor is I stick with the 12 volt motors. There's other ones that are, you know, nine volts, 7.2. I stay away from those because inevitably uh, I'll forget and I'll put 12 volts to them and burn them out. So I stay away from those. So I just buy 12 volt motors. And at 12 volts, if their maximum speed is in the 8,000 to 12,000 RPM, generally that's pretty good. Um, the other thing is, uh, and Russ thought it was kind of funny when we did a test here, but how I check them to see if they're powerful enough is I put them at 12 volts on a power supply at my workbench and I squeeze the, the motor shaft. If I can't stop that motor shaft, it's more than strong enough for our motors or for our models. And if it if I'm squeezing it, it's burning my fingers and, and slowing down, it's probably still good. But if it stops in my by squeezing it in my fingers, it's no good. That's that's my super sophisticated way to pick a motor. Um, when I'm working on a brass model, if I'm changing the motor, one of the things that I do is I stock a lot of different motors. I probably have 30 or 40 different kinds I keep in stock um, that I bought over the years. But what I do is I just um, take the gearbox that's in it and uh, just grab the like the frame of the locomotive with the gearbox in it and I take some of that rubber tube and I hook it up to the motor I uh, want a sample motor and just hold it in my hand and I run it and, and I can tell by the speed of the drivers through the range if it runs smooth and it's got the right speed it's good enough for me and um, we, the fine tuning if I want to set the you know change it up I just use the uh, DCC decoder for that so it's not super sophisticated but it works Okay, so um, away from motors, one of the things that's really hard about working on brass is, like I said, if something goes flying into the abyss, uh, if you better hope it's not something you can't get a replacement for, um, like valve gear or things like that, that there's just, you know, they're unobtainium. So what I do is when I'm, you know, at the conventions or an opportunity presents itself, I always buy these bits and pieces whenever I can. So I stock a bunch of them. I, you know, I don't know if I'll ever use them and kind of joke that my wife is going to have an amazing estate sale someday. So you want to check the obits to see when I croak because there's going to be some good stuff. So in this pile is just a sampling of the things I do that um, that purchase the Blue Rim is these in these bags here. There's some rivets for valve gear and insulators for the draw bars on your on the back of your locomotive and insulators for brake shoes. And that's a torque arm thing for one of those cannon motors. Precision scale had some of these pins for the drivers. Um, and then um, like these weird screws and stuff, I picked those up and then springs and whatever. Even these are those blue rim drivers that, you know, I probably don't know if I'll ever use them, but if I ever need them, I'll never find them. So uh, took me uh, decades of working on brass locomotives before I a micro mart ad, uh, ad kind of clued me in and I hit, I finally realized that these foam cradles are cheap. So I used to, this one on the left I've used for a million years. And then I think these come on sale for 10 bucks a piece. So um, I bought a whole bunch of them. So if I'm working on multiple projects, I can just leave them with all the bits and pieces in the trough here, well, the end scale trough and uh, do that. So I, I have a bunch of foam cradles. That's made it help like a lot easier. Okay, so on tools here too, my favorite tool is uh for working on brass engines is a sharpie believe it or not uh so i go through like a million of these sharpies so i write notes on the on the brass and and i use like the the thicker ones for uh machina sink and and all that kind of stuff another thing that i i you know when you go to paint the model all it comes all of it comes off one thing i always do with this red marker is if i'm working on a locomotive and i'm going to take the um so the drivers are, I'm going to work on the drivers. Before I do anything, I figure out which is the insulated set of drivers and say if it's a consolidation, I'll start at the first axle on the insulated wheel and I'll put a red dot. And then the second axle, two red dots and third, three, and then four on the last axle. And that keeps everything in orientation. So I don't put it back backwards or flip them around or whatever, because, you know, all these models are handmade and you know, they all have their little idiosyncrasies. And if they run good one way, it's best not to try and test the other way. Um, these uh, calipers are my other most used tool. And I and I do have a digital set, but the battery died and I never replaced it. I like this, this set here because the battery hasn't died on it yet. 
And uh, what I use this thing for is uh, a lot of times I'm scribing like this. I'll just scratch a line in and that'll tell me the fold marks for making a motor cradle or where I'm going to cut it or wherever. And then, of course, I never can remember what drill bit I have out. So I'll use that to figure out what drill bit I have. And then, uh, you know, brass wire, brass thickness. I'm constantly using these calipers. They're, they've been amazing. And so on amazing tools. Um, so I keep taps around um northwest short line sells the the sets for the you know the clearance drill and then the uh, well the two different drill bits and the taps i've got a bunch of the the different sets i have one of everything that they have over the years i've kind of accumulated that um until i had these taps i never realized how useful they are you know i thought they were you know great if you're fabricating something but the thing is is if you're working on brass you know a lot of times maybe the the threads are are screwed up that are already on there so i run the top through clean them up um sometimes somebody else has owned the model before you and stripped out the threads well I'll just go up one size and retap the whole one size full figure go back to my go back to my tray of screws and problem solved super easy so i use the uh 1.4 and the two millimeters the most and I keep extras of everything in stock. So these these are probably one of my most useful tools. And I never thought it would be that that way. I'm constantly using these. Um, another thing is if you're gonna change gears on the axles, these one of these arbor presses from Northwest Short Line, and I think Micromart uh, has a bootleg version of this you can buy. I find this like indispensable if I'm if I'm pulling wheels off axles or, or gears and stuff. Um, Northwest Shoreline sells quarters, so um, you know you could work on a locomotive that's out of quarter and and spend a forever guessing to try and get everything in quarter, but it sure is a lot easier with the tool. Um, and you and the thing about quartering is it doesn't have to be ninety degrees; it could be anything. So you could make your own tool to set them. The only thing that's critical is that all the axles are exactly the same. So if you go to work on a brass engine and you decide you're going to change the gearbox and um, change that gear and pull a wheel off, put it back on and you quarter it, um, like you're, you're wasting your time if you think that you're not going to have to quarter all the other wheels because I've tried to take that shortcut too many times and inevitably you're just going to have to quarter everything because they even the, the drivers that come from the factory are not necessarily 90 degrees or or, and that's even assuming that this Northwest short line thing is 90 degrees. So on the left here is the older one. Uh, I've actually, I don't know if I've ever even used it. This one on the right, I've used lots. Um, this is the more expensive one. And in the package, I've got all the little pins and, and stuff for it. And, and um, uh, um, like braces and things I've made to go in it, just out of bits of brass. Uh, another thing I do is there's that red Sharpie again. So uh, when you're working on brass, uh, especially if you're messing with the drivers and the valve gear, it is so critical to put it back exactly the same way as you found it and be super consistent. So even when I'm quartering, um, maybe it's overkill, but I always put uh, the insulated driver where the red side is. So they're all done exactly the same. So that's just something I, I do. So these things I've fixed in a model that somebody else had worked on and I found a million of these little wire tabs all through it. And these are amazing. So uh, if you're putting a decoder in or you're trying to wire up the motor to the, to the frame or something, um, I use tons of these. I see, I buy the 50 packs of these. So you solder a bit of wire on there and then go back to your tap set. This is a two millimeter hole in all these. So drill a hole and say you're some piece of brass on the locomotive and tap it with those taps that we have and use that two millimeter screw by probably three or four millimeters long. And there you go, you got a really nice, good solid electrical pickup to your, say your tender or your uh, locomotive. Um, that uh, the casting for the end of the, what are they called? The, the um, where the slide rod, are for the valve gear there's always a screw there in the middle of the frame i usually go to go for that to get my pickup from the locomotive side and uh, it's usually two millimeters so these tabs just fit right in uh tender pickup so 
maybe less needed in bigger scales, but maybe not. So when I first started working on brass, um, I kind of learned a lesson from from this. I, I a bunch. Of, I did a bunch of engines for a friend of mine in HO scale, and I never put tender pickups on these things. And he doesn't work on his own brass. And eventually they oxidized, and he was calling me to fix them, and I was getting a little bit too much. So I um, went back, and I I think we we retrofitted his engines, and I just became a standard for me to retro fit or to put on all mine so if you're with the electrical pickup on the tender you know it's got to go through the wheel it's got to go through a friction point on the end of the axle then it goes through the here he, uh, the the uh, bolster and you hopefully this isn't if it's a screwed on the bolster then there's a friction point there and then it's got to go through the friction of the bolster on the, on the tender and then um, then to your, say your decoder if it's in the tender that's a lot of friction points that can oxidize and get dirty so I just you know they're kind of ugly and i don't claim that these are the nicest looking things but i make i use that phosphor bronze and make a little uh wiper here that's a little piece of pc board tie underneath it and i believe these are one millimeter screws and a one millimeter hole here that's tapped with my tap i put these on there's those wire tabs a little piece of decoder wire and a two millimeter screw so on this one here the electrical pickups from the wheel right onto the wiper there's a wire that that's soldered and then it goes to uh the wire tab that's screwed to the frame right there just like this on that side inside the um tender i have another wire tab that's screwed to the frame so the only friction point is right here on the wiper so it cuts things down i found this is you know you can clean these and they last for a while and then eventually it'll oxidize or whatever it'll get dirty or and then you'll get erratic op operation I, so i just put tender wipers on now uh, I've tried to put them on the locomotive side. I haven't come up with a super great system for that. So that's just my argument for doing that. And I want to point out, see the red dots here? Those are the insulated wheels on here because <laughs> I use that Sharpie like crazy. Um, just another lesson to uh, keep an open mind, just a tip here. So I did this brass bashing article in the Gazette on uh, Lambert geese. I did two articles. One was there's that little motor that I like. And then the second was an update one putting these pulley drives. And this was the uh, uh, Mark and Mick and Britain, the Brits idea to do this. So I, I took their idea and tried it. And I was surprised that these belts work so good and they're so quiet and they work really well. Um, so and of all the articles I've written in the Gazette, and there's lots of them, probably over 60 now, this article I get asked about the most. So it must have been impactful, and I never would have thought that a belt drive would be good. So the, the point there is to keep an open mind and, you know, even look <clears throat> overseas because, you know, we don't know everything here in North America. So that people overseas are doing different things, and, you know, this just proves that they, they have some ways that are better than what we're doing. So um, I get we're, we're kind of coming to the end here. I've got a bit of a philosophy about working on brass and, you know, some people may not share. I know Jim, Jim Vale would, he would just cut up his engines. He, he didn't care and I get it. But for me, um, I have this philosophy of uh, be a craftsman, respect the craftsman. So I particularly like some of the older Japanese models are so much easier to build or work on. They're so solidly built and I get working on those. and. Those people were that built the original models were, you know, it's amazing how skilled they were. So when I work on a model, I try and respect that. I don't do crappy work. I try and what I would like to do is the next person that gets that model down the road, looks at it and goes, geez, this guy was, he really knew what he was doing. So I don't take any shortcuts. I don't cut up the model. I try and be a, unobtrusive. So that's just my philosophy. And, and I've seen a lot of really nice models that other people don't have that philosophy and they've just destroyed with a Dremel and drills and everything else. So just my preaching that that's my philosophy. Um, and, and that kind of applies down to doing clean work here. So just, just a couple examples. Uh, and this is, people ask me this, and I've seen this over and over again. So I fix models for other people that other people supposedly worked on. And they've taken like a power drill and drilled a bazillion holes into the tender. And it looks terrible. And they've taken an expensive model and it looks terrible. And um, 
you know, I think that you just take that, take those calipers, scratch a few lines and, you know, drill the same holes, but make them look neat. And once this gets sandblasted and it looked nice, and then of course you put a coal load over it and you never see it anyways, but at least you feel like you're a craftsman when you did it. Another thing is I get asked a lot about um, mounting motors. So this top one is one of my jobs. Um, this, I own this model. There's one of those uh, S-cap cordless motors, a 16 millimeter job. I made that little motor cradle right there. There's a little brass cradle there that I soldered to the existing brass um, mounting point. There used to be a big open frame motor here. And so this is my work. And there's one of those tabs I was talking about back there. That's the spot I was trying to describe. There's always a screw right there that you can put one of those electrical tabs on. Um, and this is, this is actually pretty clean work here, but I've seen a lot of models with a big glob of silicone that the motor's pressed into. And it's just like, why do you do that? Because sure, it'll work now, but here's when this, when this top model gets painted, I can take, there's two screws, one on each side here. I can pull those screws out, slide that rubber tube off and set the motor aside and paint the frame and do all the stuff I need to do to it. Whereas if you silicone it like this, you know, you spend all that time getting all this stuff in alignment, but you're going to have to cut that silicone away, paint it, and then come back and try and put new silicone there on this freshly painted model and kind of jerk around with it and probably chip the paint and stuff. Whereas this one here, you just drop the motor back in, put the two screws in place, and you're good to go. So I just, I've seen this so many times, and people ask me, oh, why don't I just do the short cut? And I think it's, you know, Respect the craftsman, be a craftsman, and just take an extra few minutes and do nicer work. That's sort of my thoughts. And, and my final piece of advice here is um, just do it. Uh, I see a lot of people that are, um, you know, just afraid to jump in, and you, you know, you'll you'll never learn if you don't give it a try. And uh, I didn't know anything at the beginning, and I'm no expert or professional now, but I'm experienced. So. Uh, thank you for staying awake for this. If you are awake, I can't see your faces, so maybe you aren't. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so there are a few questions, Craig. By the way, thank you. I, I learned a great deal from that. Um, Steve Hollenbach made a few comments and questions. Um, he was saying, let me go to the top here. Um, uh, he was saying the 16 millimeter motors are four magnets, six poles, and mm -hmm. very torquey. Um, and uh, Brian Cox said, I like that finger torque gauge, Craig, your own version of a pony brake. That's kind of pretty true. Uh, Steve also said the drills and taps come in really handy for mounting couplers. Yes, they do. And Brian came back again. How do you quarter for HON3? Um, he thought uh, Northwest Short Line didn't have a quarter for HON3. I'll let you answer that one, Craig. I can answer that one. Yeah. Uh, not very easily. Um, that uh, fancy quarter doesn't work very well with um, in HON3. Um, I've made a couple little brass plates for it that I can, with a lot of frustration and a lot of fiddling, I can make it work with that. But yeah, you're right. There really isn't a good choice for that. Um, I've seen some people make... Um, basically brass 90 degree or metal 90 degree bits and pieces that would do the same thing but for, for me i fiddle with that that uh, northwest short line thing and swear a lot and um eventually get it going okay. fair enough um steve also commented uh towards the end of your presentation was that the rear half of a sumter valley malay you were looking at it, it was yeah it's yeah, the only, okay. one I, only example I had because I usually <laughs> make them when I got one. I'm, I make them a um, brass motor mount for anything I buy with silicone on it. Okay. Uh, and then Fran Foley asked, um, uh, and this is a good one for you. I don't understand how you use a fishing crimp in, in, in place of like the rubber tube as like a connector. I think that's what you're looking at, right? Or well, they're just, uh, 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 if you pick the right ones, um, the. Uh, uh there's a one one particular size that works out to 2.4 millimeter inside i believe or two mil no sorry it's two millimeter on the inside and 2.4 i believe if you look uh those fishing crimps come in just different sizes or barrel something or others 
And if you pick the right size, it they're not as precisely machined as the ones that you get from Northwest Shortline or Nigel Lawton. And um, but they're uh, they're close enough. Once you put um, some Loctite or something in there to you know fit them in place, it, it makes up the difference. Okay, but they're not as good as the the, the specific ones.